How do you balance the demands of career and family life? Is it possible to have it all? Catholic mom, radio host, and author of One Beautiful Dream, Jennifer Fulweiler, will tell us. And later, in honor of Mother's Day, we'll discuss the special relationship between mothers and their sons. Physician and family expert Meg Meeker is here to talk about her new book, Strong Mothers and Strong Sons, and a few secrets. Finally, we'll look at the complex legacy of the late Father Ted Hesburgh at Notre Dame with the author of a new biography, American Priest. Father Wilson, Miss Campbell will join us. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. How can you make the most of an imperfect life, given the daily struggles of family and career? My next guest is here to tell us how she did it. She's the host of her own radio show on Sirius XM, the mother of six, and author of the aptly titled new book, One Beautiful Dream, the rollicking tale of personal passions, family chaos, and saying yes to them both. Here's my exclusive interview with Jennifer Fulweiler. Jennifer, I want to start with the book focuses really on this tension, I think, not only mothers have, but fathers as well. How do you balance the things you're called to with your family and the obligations around you, to say nothing of the other challenges that crop up? What does having it all mean to you now? You know, yeah, that's such a great question, Raymond. I used to think of having it all as you had your corporate job and you were Mary Poppins and you were Martha Stewart as a woman anyway, yeah. and, and yeah. combining all of these things, doing all the things. And now I think that having it all is really a question of fulfillment, being who you're meant to be, and thinking outside the box to make those things happen. Mm -hmm. You have a quote in the book. You say, you can have it all in the sense of having a rich family life and pursuing excellence in your work, but you're going to have a need, you're going to have to need to reimagine what having it all looks like. So I guess that's really what, what the book is all about and kind of captures. It is a messy, hilarious time <laughs> in many ways. Um, tell me about the, you, because you were really, I think, and, and uh, One Beautiful Dream captures it so well. You were under the weight, I think, of life and you felt the burdens around you so powerfully. Then you spoke to your friend Hallie at one point. What happened in that moment that changed the way you thought about what you were going through? Well, to put it bluntly, Raymond, we got honest. Mm -hmm. You know, before I was trying to be the best wife and mother I could be. I was, you know, I, I knew nothing about motherhood going into it, so I'm really trying to do this right. And I thought that if I were to admit to anyone that, honestly, I, I don't feel fulfilled and I'm really struggling, mm. people would interpret it like I'm saying I don't love my family or something. Mm. So there was this moment with my friend Hallie where I, it, the dam broke and I said, mm. I am not happy. And she looked at me and she said, I'm not either. Huh. And what, what realization, what came out of that realization that you weren't alone in this? that we both realized that we had been suppressing our talents and our gifts and our dreams because we thought it was the right thing to do. And mm -hmm. that was the moment we looked at each other and we said, are we so sure that this is the right thing to do, that just because we are dedicated to our families, mm -hmm. just because we do want to be good mothers, are we so sure that there is no room for exploring our talents and pursuing our own personal passions? Mm. Tell me for a moment about resistance. You talk, oh, you have a chaplain I on love it. resistance that um, people meet, now not in the political sense, but uh, <laughs> the resistances that we feel in everyday life. Um, what was holding you back from pursuing those talents, those gifts, those things you felt called to? You know, Raymond, resistance can come in so many different forms, mm -hmm. and I think it hits different people differently. For me, that resistance was the message that if you pursue your personal passions, if you have even a shred of ambition, mm -hmm. well, you're not dedicated to your family. And that mm -hmm. was the message that held me yeah. back. And it was only when I realized that this is not an either or discussion, being a dedicated parent, putting God and family first, and d being the person you're meant to be, doing the things that you love, pursuing your ambitions, 
This is not an either or discussion. It's a question of how we have both and. Which makes things much more complicated. Oh, so complicated. <laughs> that, and I think you see that in the book. This is a messy book. I do not for a minute pretend that I have it all together. Yeah, no, you, you reveal a lot here. Some of it very personal. Um, your financial woes, uh, your personal struggles, uh, feelings of inadequacy, um, health crises. I mean, things kind of you, you feel the temperature rising as you get into this book. <laughs> there was a moment where you're pregnant with your fourth child and you're very concerned about now having a much larger family. And the number, the difference from one to two and from two to four is an enormous number. Um, and then you see a Mexican family outside of church one day, which brought you to what realization? It brought me to the realization that when we think of family size and our life's goals and anything in life, we need to have what Sheldon Vonnegut called a wholeness of vision. Isn't mm. that a great phrase? Yeah. Wholeness of vision, meaning when you're making your life choices, whether it's thinking about adopting a child, having a child, serving your community, whatever it is, a big work decision, mm -hmm. think about what, what will you think about all of this at the end of your life. And when I, I looked at that family, my dad's from Mexico, I have a great connection mm -hmm. to the Mexican American community. Yeah. And when I saw them in this life filled culture where everything is all about family and they're always mm -hmm. putting love and family first, I realized, mm -hmm. man, they, they've got it all figured out and I think I, I could learn a little bit from them. Mm. Well, there's another, there's another layer of complication here in that you have a blood disorder that right. when you're pregnant, there's a clotting that takes place that can kill you. Yeah, well, yes. Uh, was, there any, was there any hesitation? I mean, you talk in, in you know, detail here. Uh, what did you go through with each pregnancy? I mean, you have six children now. Right. There had to be a point where you said, this could be the last child I carry. It, it, we did. With each pregnancy, we looked at it, and we did our homework, and we talked to doctors, and we thought that we had it managed. And you see what happened in the book is that that unraveled very quickly. In my sixth pregnancy, I had bilateral pulmonary embolisms. Mm -hmm. My lungs were full of blood clots, and this happened while I was on blood thinners. So th it's a very scary situation. They said if you get pregnant again, then there's nothing we can do because you already had pulmonary embolisms while you're on blood thinners. It's wow. a scary situation. Wow. But you pressed forward nonetheless. How did your faith take you through that? The first time you did this, by the way, when you were first pregnant, you were an atheist. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Uh, you're, you're, you're out there with no tight, with, with no, oh. no nap. Yeah, well, I was actually diagnosed right before we came into the Catholic Church. This all that mm -hmm. that happened right before we became Catholic. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I are both converts to Catholicism. We are also both only children. I have mm -hmm. atheist background. And so coming into this, and you see this in one beautiful dream that you see me wrestling with where does faith fit into this picture and how can I be not just the best wife, not just the best mother, but the best Christian I can be, but still balance everything from my health issues to ambition to everything mm. else. There's a, there's a line in the book I want to read to you where uh, it's really when you and Joe, your husband Joe, come together, you have, you're starting your family and you write, God burst into our lives with all the subtlety of a neutron bomb, shattered everything we thought we knew, snatched up our carefully crafted plans and set them on fire, <laughs> then gave us a big hug and tossed us onto a path that we could never have imagined for ourselves. <laughs> What's the lesson here for people who are facing similar situations? And there are a lot of people at home that no doubt are going through similar crises, worries, concerns, life and death situations, and financial woes. I don't think you have any choice but to see it as an adventure. Mm -hmm. And life can be really hard and life can get really messy and you know what it will if you're on this same pursuit that I am mm -hmm. trying to be the person you were meant to be and still put your priorities in the right order mm -hmm. it is going to get difficult it is going to get messy and guess what you're going to fail you're going to make the wrong decisions you're going to make mistakes but Raymond I mean do, do we really have a choice but to just turn it over to God and say all right it's an yeah. adventure there's one moment in, in one beautiful dream um, first, wh why did you call it One Beautiful Dream? There's a quote from St. Francis of Rome, one of my favorite saints, where she, she did not intend to go into the married life. She wanted to be a cloistered nun in a convent. Mm -hmm. She ended up getting married, and she so threw herself into this life that she never expected and initially didn't want that at the end of her husband's life, he turned to her and said, my whole life has been one beautiful dream mm. of purest happiness, mm. thanks to your love. I also like the play on dream. Dream can mean something you aspire to, right. a goal. It can mm -hmm. also mean something that feels surreal. And so I mm. like that, the double meaning of the word yeah. dream in this case. Well, at times it takes on the cast of a nightmare, Jennifer. <laughs> it does, I mean, so right. there's a moment where you're in bed, you're on bed rest for like a month. Yeah. You know, you can't leave the bed. The health bills are piling up on your husband's side of the bed. Um, you, you've got children running around. 
uh, friends come over, neighbor, the, for people from church who have a meal ministry, <laughs> basically bail you out right. and they, they present you with food. What did you learn through that? And how did it change the way you approach or accept these challenges? It shattered my entire worldview, Raymond, because it showed me you can't do it alone. And by mm -hmm. it, I mean faith. I mean life. Mm -hmm. I mean anything that you are trying to do. You know, I, I don't think we realize here in the United States and, and just in the West in general, we don't realize how individualistic we are. We always mm -hmm. want to be able to do everything perfectly ourselves, yep. to be perfectly self-sufficient. That is not historical Christian view. I mean, that is not really what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And it took me having everything fall apart in my life, my health, my finances, before I got a clue and realized none of us were meant to do any of this alone. Mm. You, you, I mean, you talk about, and it's a, it's a nice idea, it's a good thought, that we can, we can have it all if we change the definition of all. However, that said, you meet a Father George at confession who tells you something that reorients, really, the way you consider life and that balance between family and the work you're called to, which, I'm sorry, those two things can be in opposition many times. The time that f the family demands, you need to give to your work, particularly if you're doing something like broadcast, which looks like we're just making this up and it's fun. The truth of the matter is it, there's a lot of research involved. You've got to read the book. In your case, you've got to write the book. Um, what did he tell you that changed everything for you? He said, think like you are a member of an orchestra and not a soloist. He said, you've been approaching your life like you're a, a violinist soloist up on a stage. Think like you are part of an orchestra. You can still create something beautiful. You can create something more beautiful. You just have to understand that you are part of something bigger. And yes, your work, playing your music mm. matters, but it matters more when it's part of something bigger. Mm. You, you, the quote in the book, you, you quote him, and you, it says, unite your family, bring them into what you do and bring what you do into your family. Move in unity, not apart from each other. That's a really important, crucial thing that so many, so many people miss. I mean, I know a, lot of, a number of very successful people, and they've lost their family on the road to unbelievable success. Yeah. But is that successful? It's not, and, and you'll never think it is at the end of your life. My husband and I both come from very careerist backgrounds, that worldview where all, mm -hmm. all happiness is contained in having the right business card. Mm -hmm. And we see people now as life gets played out, they're waking up one day, they're 50, 60, 70 years old, and they're saying, I made a mistake. I yeah. made the wrong choices. Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a horrible realization yeah. to make because then you can't change, you really can't do anything about it. The past is dead. Uh, you talk at length in One Beautiful Dream about that desire to write your first book. Yeah. And we see you go through the trials, the tensions. I mean, you're writing chapters in cars, um, uh, trying to get the manuscript off. This particularly resonated with me because uh, I know the mania right, right. of this. <laughs> you know, you're right in between, you write when you can. Um, it reminded me, there's a wonderful Joseph Conrad story. It might be in his diary somewhere. And he talks about, um, he had a sick wife and a child with a hundred and something fever, Gosh. and they're in the other room, and he still returns to the table to finish the chapter. <laughs> and I often I think it. of that, you know, that and the Sondheim line, you know, finishing the hat, how you have to finish yeah. the hat. You look at the world through a window while you finish the hat. Um, there is some of life you trade on yeah. to create a book or anything, really. Right. How do you find that balance? I think you take it one day at a time and you realize that the right answer for your choices with what you do with your time, the right answer last week might not be the right answer this week. And you mm. see this in the book, Raymond. Yeah. There were times that I was trying to finish that first manuscript that I said, it's time to walk away. I just, I sense it. My kids need me. My family needs me. I need to walk away. Then there were other times where I said, you guys go watch five hours of Netflix. I'm getting this done. I don't care. Cup cupcakes for lunch. Yeah. I am finishing this chapter. And I, I think you just have to accept that it it is really moment by moment. Decisions. Yeah, no, it's an improvisatory act. Yeah, it and is. that's I what love the that. book is really, <laughs> you see that improvisatory quality. You kind of have to roll with the punches, yeah. and the punches keep coming from oh, ways boy. you don't expect and in, 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 in dimensions that you never quite anticipate, I think. Tell me, now looking back, you've now got two books to your credit. You've got a radio show every day. Two hours a day. <laughs> oh, what does prep time look like? You have to prep for this radio show. You don't wing a two-hour radio you show. Don't. So where do you find time to do that? I just I have dedicated time where I shut the door to my studio 
and, and I do it guilt-free, and I turn off my phone, and I say, nobody can bother me. And, and a big thing for me, Raymond, was letting go of that guilt, saying, mm -hmm. no, you cannot ask me where your lunch is. No, you cannot text, text me. This is my hour, two hours before I go on the air. I need this time. I have this commitment to my audience and to my job. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you just you have to do it unapologetically. Mm -hmm. You are a graduate of uh, the University of Texas. That's right. Where they have recently made a decision to describe masculinity as a mental health issue. Um, you're the mother of two children, uh -huh. two boys. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, I didn't know the University of Texas was so traditionalist in just <laughs> subscribing to these gender binary views. I thought I there was no such thing as men and women, so why are we even having this discussion? Apparently there is. <laughs> what do these words even mean? I, I think a, as a mother, I think that this is, it, I think that this is, is in conflict, frankly, with the ideas of individualism, letting mm. people be who they're meant to be. There are, there are some boys who are more masculine than others. Yeah. Frankly, I think it's in contradiction to the women's empowerment movement, things like women's sports, you know, that sort of thing. When we blur these lines between what gender is all about, a lot of times it's actually women who end up getting mm. impacted. When you have, you know, someone who was born a man joining a women's sports team, that kind of thing. I think I think it's a, a ridiculous, and as usual, women are going to pay the price. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the Edel Gathering, yes, which you yes. founded. Tell me about this. All right, so we it's we pronounce it Adele, perhaps, Adele, sorry. perhaps, but we might be wrong. Actually, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, I don't know. I just so, read it. So yeah, what yeah. do I know? So it is it is it is a gathering for Catholic women, and here is our mission, Raymond. Very noble mission here. We believe in bringing Catholic women together through good wine and bad karaoke. Oh, I already you know, like it. I, we we felt like there were a lot of wonderful retreats out there where women can you know get up at seven o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and pray the rosary, and they're just we we've, we've got that in the right. Catholic world. And we said. Um, Let's stay up till midnight and drink wine. We think there's a place for that, too. So our conference starts at noon, and it goes until midnight. And there is the worst karaoke you have ever heard, at least wow. when I'm on the stage. And it's, it is a chance for Catholic women to get together informally. And you know what's funny is we have so many women walk away who say, I walked into this gathering losing my faith. And now that I have seen that I can let down my hair, and I can, frankly, to be cool <laughs> with other right. Catholic women, right. I think I can do this. Like I think I think I'm going to go back to mass, and I think I'm coming back. Well, to there mass. is this thing. I had an interview earlier, and they were talking about how did you feel about leaving the secular world, yeah, and embracing Catholic journalism. Well, I've never done that. I said I I don't know how that feels because <laughs> I've never done that. Right. You know, I didn't know there was some island of perfection <laughs> out here, and I'd love the address because I would like to go there. <laughs> I've never been to this island of Catholic perfection. Right. The one I see is pretty messy, filled with scandals. You got people attacking each other. This is the world. That, it's called the world, <laughs> right. and you're Catholic in that world. Right. And maybe that's what your gathering is sort of appealing to. Okay. It's a recognition that. We're, we're whole people, we're in a real world that's conflicted and messy, and we have something to offer yes. and can still have a good time doing it. Can I write that down and make that our mission statement? There you I go. really Put like that. Put that down as your mission statement. <laughs> Who did you write the book for? When I read it, I thought this could also be called not one beautiful dream, but embrace the mess. Because I it, love it. it's kind of, it's the mess of life. It's a mess we all deal with, whether we admit it or not. You're a lot more candid than I would be, but <laughs> uh, you, you, we all deal with the chaos of life. And finding, bringing order and excellence out of that is always a challenge. Who did you write this book for? I wrote it for anyone who struggles between their obligations and their passions. Mm -hmm. And honestly, Raymond, I'm getting some of the strongest feedback from single people who say, wow. I have the same struggle in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm volunteering at my church. I'm taking care of my parents. And I'm wondering, where do my ambitions and my goals fit into this process? Mm. I wrote it for anyone who lives in that struggle. I love it. The book. One Beautiful Dream, The Rollicking Tale of Family Chaos, Personal Passions, and Saying Yes to Them Both. Why the, why the burnt chicken on that? Did you, <laughs> are you responsible for this? I am responsible for this. That was actually the 17th cover that we did. Uh, you, please pray oh, for the people like at me. my publishing house. You're like me. All the graphics design people <laughs> hate you, Jennifer. I, I was at a publishing industry party. I made a joke in front of the people from my publisher that I was the most high maintenance offer author they had ever worked with in terms of cover and Raymond they all just laughed nervously and nobody contradicted that statement. No, they didn't. Well I know the feeling. That was after me. That's right. Well you were not quite the most. Yes. <laughs> Jennifer Fulwiler, thank you Such for being here. Be here. My next guest has spent 25 years practicing pediatric and adolescent medicine as well as counseling teens and their parents. 
In her latest book, she casts her gaze at the unique bond between mothers and sons. It's called Strong Mothers, Strong Sons, Lessons Mothers Need to Raise Extraordinary Men. In honor of Mother's Day, I sat down with Dr. Meg Meeker to talk about the book and discuss those secrets every mom should know to strengthen or rebuild her relationship with her boy. Take a look. Meg, you start this book talking about a mother's influence over their son yeah. and that you're really teaching them how to relate to all women. How so? Yes. Well, I think that mothers are more in tune to their son's emotions and the emotional side. And it's difficult because mothers don't always understand how boys are thinking and how they want to relate. But I think that it's very important for a mother to show boys how women think and how uh, to relate to different women of all ages. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, they, they teach them. Mothers draw their sons out, if you will, get them to talk a little bit more, get them to talk to them as their moms, and then to talk to other women in their lives. Tell me the difference between the way girls are wired as opposed to boys, and why is it so difficult for a mother to sort of tap into that wiring? Oh, well, they're, you know, they're wired differently from the get-go. Mm -hmm. You know that as a, oh, as a yeah. dad of uh, fathers <laughs> or as sons and daughters. <laughs> but boys are very visual people. Boys don't have to talk as much. Mm -hmm. uh, boys have a need, a physical need to let their energy out and to release. Mm -hmm. um, and, and girls don't. You know, girls bond with people through talking. Mm. Boys bond with people through doing things. Yeah. Go throwing a ball or being outside or doing an activity. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for mothers because they're always trying to talk to their sons and draw them out and thinking, my son doesn't want to bond with me because he doesn't want to talk. Right. Well, that's not true. Well, he does want to bond, but in a different way. And in the book, you talk about the importance of that verbalization. Exactly. And, and for the mother to teach her son an emotional language. Yes. But that's yes. often difficult. It's very hard. And really what I'm trying to do when you, and I, my whole chapter on teach your son an emotional, given an emotional vocabulary, is not teaching a boy to feel differently or feel more, but to help him identify his feelings and say, you are angry, you are sad. Now this is what you do with your anger and your sadness. Because uh -huh. boys will shut down in second and third and fourth grade. You know, a lot of them will sort of give a step up her lip and, and um, you know, not cry and that kind of thing. But it's really the mom who comes along and says it's really okay not just to cry when you're little, but to have anger and to feel anger and to learn to do something with it. And I think it's important so these boys don't grow into 35 and 40 year olds who sort of implode because they've never dealt with any kind mm, of feelings. They've never let those emotions Exactly. Up. And the mother, you think, is the key to sort of I unlocking do. it? Well, mothers are verbal and again, mm -hmm. they bond through, through talking mm -hmm. and dads tend not to. And and dads, I think, are afraid of turning their sons into weak people by talking about emotions. And again, the purpose in the book isn't to make boys weak. It's to help them identify their feelings and know what to do with them in a healthy way. But how do you do that? How do you create that bond, that that emotional connection, that emotional vocabulary yeah. without feminizing him? Like? Well, because all you're doing is helping them identify feelings that are already there. Are you mad? Are you sad? Mm -hmm. And here's what you do when you're mad or when you're sad or when you're happy. But you're not I'm not advocating getting boys to talk on and on and on about their yeah, feelings. Not, they don't have no, to join the panel on the field. No, view. no, no, okay. exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's not about talk. It's, it's learning to identify their feelings and then learning what to do with them. Mm -hmm. Anger, for instance, is a huge one for young Tell boys. me about the importance of affection, a mother's affection toward her son as he grows developmentally. I mean, yeah. you see this in your practice. Yeah. What happens if it's not there, and how does that affection, or should it, yeah. change in the course of a boy's well, maturation? Well, it, ha it has to change during the course of a boy's life. And I always tell parents, the first 10 years are really, of a boy's life are really about mom. Mom mm -hmm. is the one who kind of cuddles him and puts him to bed at night, and he feels safe and comfortable with mom but then when he moves into those pre-adolescent years he starts to feel a little creepy with that because he's learning that he's growing into a man so he gives a lot of pushback to mom mm. hurts mother's feelings but it's very important for mothers to allow their sons to push back and then for dad in the home to say you know what the next 10 years of his life are really all about me because mm. boys are visual yeah. and they have to see a good man in, t in order to turn into a good man mm. so if a mother appropriately stands back and lets her boys become more independent during the teen years and then they go off to college 
the boys will circle back around in their mid-twenties. They'll have a great relationship with their mother. If their mother doesn't let go, they start to feel that their mothers are dependent and needy. And I'm mm -hmm. seeing a lot of that, Raymond. Really? Because mothers are hyper-parenting. They, they want to... Um, they smother the boys. They smother the boys. Mm -hmm. They do too much for the boys. And then these boys hit 25, and they really don't know how to apply for a job or have a job or right. stand on their own two feet because mom makes life too nice too for them. dominating exactly yeah yeah exactly. And they never really they can never really blossom and they've as lot and they've got to learn to let go mm. yeah what happens when though it, and it is emotionally wrenching when mommy becomes the enemy yes uh, when she is sort of pushed away yeah. how are, how do you advise mothers deal with that and it is part of the natural growth of a Well, I have a whole chapter. Yeah. Um, he has a bow and arrow and the target's on your back. Oh. And that's how mothers feel. <laughs> yeah, as a mother of a 22-year-old yeah. son, I really felt like the enemy. Hmm. But I think, first of all, we have to learn, don't take it personally. It's not about us, it's about him. Because mothers will, their son will say something to them and they'll immediately say, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Right. It's not about you doing anything wrong. It's a process God designed for him to learn how to think on his own and to stand on his own. Hmm. So not to take it personally and to understand that even young teenage boys have temper tantrums like they did when they were two. Mm -hmm. yeah. You talk here about home, yes. the importance of home. When, in your practice in researching and writing this book, what are the things that men most remember from their childhoods and how does a mother fit into that? Oh, mother is a man's home and I never thought about she that. She is the home. She is the home. She's the the sense of home. Mm -hmm. Home is where my mother is. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about that until I was interviewing men for the book and one man said to me, it was very chilling, he said, you know, I've been in battle, I've been in wars and it's not uncommon that when a man is dying in, uh, in battle that he cries out for his mother, not his wife. And so it's wow. that sense that this, these are where my roots are. This is my initial comfort. She's the, the person who taught me what love was, who taught me how to trust people, who taught me who God is. Mm. Often it's the mother who teaches young boys that, and that's how they set down their roots. So they learn to be very, um, to stand on solid ground when they're young children through the comfort and security of mom. Mm. So that's what I mean by home. Mm. You really, you mentioned it a moment ago, how important the mother is to connect Connecting the boy and later the man yes. with faith and God. Now, I thought, and I've seen it, that it's really the father's example, isn't it, that the boy will model, and if the father is not faithful, is not a regular churchgoer, chances are the boy won't be either. Exactly. Ideally, it's the dad in the home. Mm -hmm. But you and I know there are a lot of single moms out there. Almost and half of all Half moms. of all, yeah. All, and so mothers often are the ones who take their kids to mass, who make them do their catechism, who teach that to them. Mm -hmm. Dads are often very busy. Mm -hmm. Mom's the one who prays with them. Mom is the one who says, this is what Jesus' character is like. And sure, they look to dad and, and they look up to dad and they watch dads very, very carefully, mm -hmm. but often it's mom who has the, the conversations about who God is and who Christ is. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that pray more with the kids. And they really are the bridge they are. to the father. Explain that because yeah. in some relationships, in some households, you see uh, there's almost a war between the parents yeah. for the children's affections, yeah. which is not a good thing. Drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's, and I, you know, I speak a lot around the country and I speak directly to moms about that. You cannot criticize dad in a home, whether dad is there or whether he isn't. A mother is the one who teaches her son how to connect with a dad when he maybe, maybe feels alienated. She's the one who should be respectful, look up to the dad so that the son will follow suit and respect and love the dad as well. Mm. If a son hears his mother constantly complaining what, about dad and what he is doing, she will sort of pull him over to his side and he'll start to believe that his dad really isn't a good person. Huh. Well, that not only harms the son-dad relationship, but this son's gonna grow in to a, a man, get married, and become a dad. And if all he hears is, gee whiz, being a dad isn't very good because I heard mom criticize dad and complain about mm. dad, it really sets him up for failure as a dad, So it will. poisons his it ability poisons to him. enter into a exactly. full relationship and later. We, wow. Because we're verbal people, we don't realize how devastating criticism of the husband is to the son. And we're living in a culture that dad bashes all the time. Mm. Try to find a nice Father's Day card. Oh yeah, or a it's sitcom. terrible. Yeah, a sitcom. It. Raymond, you know, uh, um, uh, everybody loves Raymond. Everybody loves Raymond, and that's true. 
Sometimes. Yes. <laughs> If they watch the right channel. <laughs> That's right. Sometimes at my house, sometimes not. <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk about the thing that I think causes all parents to tremble a little bit, but particularly mothers. Mothers yes. often offshore or delegate the big talk, talk. about sex yes. to the father. Yes. Is that a good thing? It depends. Mm -hmm. I tell parents, because parents always say, who should tell the kids? Right. You know who should, and I said in every family there's one person who's chicken and one who, person who's a really big chicken. <laughs> so, so, so the the lesser of the two goes. Uh -huh. So it really doesn't matter. But I think it's important that whoever can sort of take a big deep breath and have a very respectful, honest, sometimes blunt conversation. Mm. It's very important because the bottom line is Raymond. You know, with your kids, our kids are being talked to about sex, yep. sexual activity, and their sexuality, mm -hmm. and it's very important that we teach them and usually it's the mother because again we're driving in the car Dad's when the busy. kids if dad is busy and mm -hmm. the kids are having the conversation in the back or the son comes home from school and he's a little disturbed because of something he heard at school mm -hmm. so we pick up the pieces and it's very important to sit boys down and talk to them why is it so important do you you have a list here of mm -hmm. things every mother needs to know that you yeah. see in your practice yeah. Share that with the audience. Sexual activity during the teen years is medically very, very dangerous. When do the teen years, how are they defined? Uh, well, starting when? 13, mm -hmm. 12 to 13. And, and we, it's starting earlier. It's starting earlier, and what kids are seeing, we now know that the age of that boys first see pornography has gone from about 14 down to about 9 or 10. Mm. So kids are getting a lot of messages. Sexual activity during the teen years is very dangerous from a medical standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, and from a spiritual standpoint. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we teach kids, young boys in particular, how not to be sexually active. And I tell parents, if you don't train them not to be sexually active, they will. They'll follow the pack. Mm -hmm. And that's where the pack is going. It's also important to teach kids how to appreciate and respect their sexuality and to preserve modesty. What is the opener for a mother approaching this, particular this topic of sexuality, particularly single moms? Easy. Okay. Easy. And here you go. You sit your son down and you say, Andy, I know now you're, you know, a freshman in high school or in the eighth grade, and I'll bet you that you're seeing and hearing a lot of things that are a little bit confusing. Or maybe you have some friends who are sexually active. Do you? And he kind of looks down and he pretends he didn't hear what you said. So you keep on going. And you say, if I were you, and I'm growing up in this culture getting a lot of information about sex and movies and so forth, I'd be a little confused. So I know you might be uncomfortable talking about this, but I need to tell you some things. So, so you don't have to respond, but let me tell you, it's very important that you're not sexually active during your teen years. And I know you're going to feel like um, an outcast and the weirdo, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. And you start to lay it out. And then you say to him, I know it's uncomfortable, but I want you to always realize, I have all the right answers. Your friends don't. So when you hear things at school, I know you'll feel embarrassed. Please come home and ask me questions. I want to be the go-to person when you have questions about sex. Mm -hmm. And it can be done. And I'll tell you something, Raymond. The more you talk about it with your kids, the easier it gets. Because they'll come to you they will. in they a will. crisis when something arises. Not only your kids, your kids' friends will. I get mm -hmm. calls from my 22-year-old's friends at college asking me questions. Wow. And, and it's well, delightful. Well, they go to the expert. That's why. Yeah, but, but it's delightful. And, um, and, and, and we laugh and we giggle because I, th I think, you know, kids want to hear what you have to say. They want to hear. Mm -hmm. And they also want to know. It's very important that we communicate to boys. Your sexuality is wonderful. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And we need to communicate that because the world out there and the media is telling them it's not so great. We had a couple of emails. One of them I want to share with you. It wasn't only one. There were several like this where a mother found out that her child, a young boy, yep. had a sexual encounter. Mm -hmm. And at times these were repeated. What should the reaction be? This particular mother freaked out. Yep. Uh, the dad came in. They, they broke off a friendship because it was a family friend. Yep. What would you recommend? In well, that, that, that comes up all the time. You know, first of all, um, if he, again, if he hadn't been trained how not to be sexually active, he follows the pack. Mm -hmm. So I would sit down with a son. If you're going to freak out, which most parents do, do it not in the presence of the child. Yeah. 
work it out and then sit down with him as a couple if you can, a mom and a dad, and say, listen, we understand what you did and I understand um, you know, why you did it because I, the, the dad will say, I was a young man too, but it's very important that you stop and mm -hmm. it's very important that you take a, a, a very dramatic right hand turn now because if you continue along this path being sexually active, you're going to end up with either a disease or you're going to end up really with some emotional scars. Mm -hmm. So our job now it, as your parents is to help you from now until you're married, navigate a culture that's toxic that's sexually very toxic, mm -hmm. that's going to constantly want to lure you back into sexual activity, but because we love you and we respect you, we're going to help you avoid that. But it's a very important, Raymond, not to shame the boy, because kids will never come back if you shame them. Mm -hmm. So say, you know what, your sexuality is so important to us, we're going to help you protect it and preserve it from now on. So please come to us in the future if you're thinking about this again. And, and delaying that first sexual encounter, encounter. preferably to marriage, is, is so ideal. important. And setting up that ideal. Exactly. We hear in the culture so often in kids, I mean, they walk into the dorm and there's the, I remember when I was in college, yeah. you walk in the dorm, there's the fishbowl full of condoms when exactly. you walk in. You point out in the book, condoms are not no. The, 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 the silver bullet that they're, they claim to be it, when it comes to protecting kids, in quotes, from STDs. Exactly. Tell us about how, what you're seeing in your practice. You know, kids often always ask me, but Dr. Meeker, don't condoms work? And I uh -huh. say, well, it depends on what infection you're talking about and, you're t and how old the, the person is. The bottom line mm. is condoms don't work well enough. Mm. They work best against HIV. They work mm. poorly against infections like HPV, mm. which we now know young boys are getting um, vaccinated against. Yep. They work m less well against things like herpes, which is an epidemic. One in five Americans over age 12 tests positive for genital herpes. Mm. That's tough stuff to hear. But this is very serious stuff we're talking about. So sending a kid off to college with a, a you know, a Percival or a, a, a back pocket full of condoms is not the answer. It's very, very serious. What is the most important thing that mothers need to do that they often don't in relation to their sons? They need to raise their expectations of their son's behavior, the way he talks, the way he treats them, the way he treats women. You know, we, we dumb our boys down. We treat them like they can't do this and they can't do that and they need us to help them do it, no matter what it is, whether it's applying to college or applying to job. And we also treat our boys as though they're out of control sexually. It's one of the most devastating things that we do to boys. And um, we need to say, look, you are 16, you're 17, you're 18, I know this is tough, but I'm your mom, I'm linking arms with you, and you're not going to go down that route. I believe in you and I know you can do it. So we really need to, to use an overused word, empower our boys to stand on their own two feet, to take charge of themselves, their mind, their body, and their spirit, mm -hmm. and really launch them. And we can do it. Yeah, I know. Women civilize men. And, we do. And, and teach them how to be human. First mom, and later, yes. the misses. And if mom doesn't do it, God help the wife. Oh, yeah, the poor wife. Poor wife, just, yeah. She's, she's out of luck. Strong mothers, strong sons, lessons mothers need to raise extraordinary men. It's an extraordinary book. Thank Thanks, you, Thanks, Raymond. Finally tonight, we're going to take a closer look at one of the most influential American priests of the 20th century. Father Ted Hesburgh served as president of the University of Notre Dame for 35 years but his reach extended far beyond the bounds of academia. My next guest was a personal friend of Hesburgh's, and he's also his biographer. Please welcome the author of American Priest, The Ambitious Life and Conflicted Legacy of Notre Dame's Father Ted Hesburgh. Father Bill Miss Campbell, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Raymond. A pleasure to be with you. Father, tell me, how did you come to write this biography, particularly since others have already written uh, biographies of Father Hesburgh, including his own memoir, God, Country, and Notre Dame. Why was it important to do another look at this life? Well, initially, Raymond, I began uh, this project as a way of trying to understand the journey that Catholic higher education in general and mm. Notre Dame in particular had been on 
in the decades since I had been involved in the 1970s, 80s, and into the 1990s. I first identified that I wanted to do this study of Father Hesburgh, and I brought it to him in the 1990s. Hmm. And it was out of a quest to understand what had happened in higher education and what had happened at Notre Dame such that the whole issue of Catholic mission and Catholic identity had become a contested issue. And hmm. I thought studying the Hesburgh story would allow me to get at that, and I believe it has. Mm. What kind of friendship and relationship did you have with Father Ted? I mean, you're, you're a part of the same order. Tell me how you introduced the project to him. We are both priests in the Congregation of Holy Cross. Of course, we're both based at Notre Dame. Father Hesburgh spent 70 years of his life there, and now it's hard to believe I'm coming up on having spent close to 40 years of my mm. own life at uh, Notre Dame. I was serving in the history department uh, in the 1990s. I was chairing the department at the time when this idea uh, really uh, coalesced that I would write this uh, study of Father Hesburgh. I knew that I would not be able to do it right away, mm -hmm. but I was aware, Raymond, that I needed to interview him mm. to get him on the record. And so one evening, I called him up. He was working away in his office. Folks yeah. familiar with Notre Dame know that after his retirement, he had a spacious office on the 13th floor of what is now the Hesburgh Library. Mm -hmm. And I was working in my office, and I called him up. He said, come on over. And I came over, yeah. and I introduced the idea to him. He had some questions about it, but we eventually agreed that he would cooperate with me. It's not an authorized biography, but he gave me cooperation on the project. And so then we had a drink to uh, sort of uh, cement the arrangement. And dare I say, we, uh, we started talking and kept talking for the next two hours. Mm. So that was the, the original occasion for the book getting underway. Hmm. And you, you interviewed him many times uh, in, in 1998, right? In, 19, in 1998, we had extended interviews up at the Land O'Lakes property. Mm. Some of your viewers who are familiar with the Land O'Lakes statement, that yes. uh, place would resonate with them. But uh, we flew up to Land O'Lakes and I interviewed him over six successive nights. Mm. Father Hesburgh was very much a night person. He liked to sleep late and then to work late. Mm. And so he would actually go out fishing with the caretaker up there mm. and come back. And from about 9 o'clock until 1.30, 2 o'clock, we would have these extended interview sessions. Mm. And uh, I have him on tape for about 25 to 30 hours, wow. something like that. And those interviews, which I have, of course, kept, uh, they are a key part of the research for this book, mm -hmm. but, of course, have been supplemented by other materials in mm -hmm. his papers and various other sources. Father, I want to go to the heart of your book, um, and I, we have to back up a little bit for this. Father, Ted Hesburgh was really a priest of the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council. Tell me how he approached that council and his arrival at Notre Dame as president in 19, what was it, 1952. 1952. So in some ways he spans the council, Raymond. He experiences life prior to the Second Vatican Council and then, of course, is much influenced by it and sees himself as implementing much of the sort of teaching of the council, which I'll come to in a minute. But he has a very rapid rise at Notre Dame, is made president at age 35, and uh, he's leading Notre Dame. In those days, the presidency of the university was held in conjunction with the superiorship of the local community. Mm. Now, the superiorship of the Holy Cross order at Notre Dame is limited by canon law to six years. So Father Ted initially thought he was going to have six years in the job. So he wanted to make a mark. He's an extraordinarily talented and energetic person. But he sets off to uh, build Notre Dame. He has this grand ambition that he wants to build Notre Dame as the great Catholic 
University. Mm. And he gets engaged in that undertaking and effort. I try and detail this in the book. In 1958, however, he is renewed as president and the two positions are separated off. Someone else uh -huh. becomes the local superior. And Father Hesburgh continues his uh, leadership of the university. The current of reform is in the air once uh, Pope John the 23rd is elected as our pontiff, mm -hmm. and Father Hesburgh is cheering Vatican II along. He's not a delegate to the Second Vatican Council, but he sees documents like Gaudium et Spes, et cetera, mm -hmm. as, as deeply, deeply important and fulfilling the kind of vision that he has. Mm. And he sees that he wants to expand the role of the laity, certainly one of the great themes of mm. Vatican II. And uh, uh, this is part of then how he tries to guide Notre Dame in those years subsequent to the council. Yeah. Uh, he sees himself very much as fulfilling what the council had laid out. Well, he, he certainly expands the university, turns it into one of the premier Catholic institutions in the country, and nothing perhaps is more seismic or influential on Catholic education writ large than the Land O'Lake Statement, which um, he guides in 1967. Tell me about that and how, in your mind, this may have been one of the uh, tensions in his legacy and perhaps black marks. Yes. Here is where my t subtitle, The Conflicted Legacy of Father Ted Hesburg, comes into play. So there's a kind of contradiction at work in Father Hesburg. He wants to build the great Catholic university, mm. but he is concerned about needing uh, to acknowledge the authority of the institutional church. Mm. And so at Land of Lakes, Land of Lakes, he and a number of other Catholic educators, leaders in Catholic education, many of them Jesuit uh, priests, they were pretty much all priests there, mm -hmm. uh, essentially have this declaration of independence in which they say, we only acknowledge the authority of uh, the academic community. Mm. And so you have this strange circumstance where the people who are trying to build a great Catholic university essentially want to separate themselves off from the authority of the church. Mm. And then over the subsequent years, Raymond, as you would be well aware from all of your reporting over the years, yeah. Catholic higher education has gone in some complex and sometimes negative directions yeah. where the secularizing process has been at work because these institutions in a quest for prestige, they wanted acceptance by the secular academic establishment, they are becoming more and more mirror images of that establishment. Now, mm, for Father yeah. Hesburgh, he certainly wanted to keep Notre Dame Catholic and a lot. Uh, you visited the campus recently. Yeah. There's an incredible Catholic feel yeah. to the university, the basilica, the chapels and the dorms, mm -hmm. etc. But the central academic project has lost some of its distinctiveness whether or not we're providing for our students the kind of Catholic education that uh, we promise is a big question mark. And I think you can trace that back to the Lander Lake statement and development subsequent to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Father Hesburgh, as you, as you note in the book, he was very close to Pope Paul VI, but Humane yes. Vitae, on that issue, he was something of a dissenter. He was not at all pleased with that uh, papal uh, 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 exhortation. Exactly. He was a quiet dissenter. He didn't come out in, in any uh, public way, the way some theologians did, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're absolutely right. There was a real bond and friendship, almost a brotherhood, between Father Hesburgh, who met the then Cardinal Montini in 1960. Mm -hmm. They hit it off so well, and this bond and friendship continued after Paul VI became Pope. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
Father Hesburgh leaned very much. He was influenced by his membership on the Rockefeller Foundation board. Mm -hmm. He worried about uh, the population issue and was expecting that Paul VI would uh, uh, permit artificial birth control. So he was mm -hmm. surprised when Humane Vitae came down and there began to be a distance. There was some dispute between Father Hesburgh and certain Vatican officials, and there was a rupture, a rupture mm. in the friendship. It's a sad, it's a sad story in some way, mm. because these two uh, men who had enjoyed each other's company, uh, essentially there's no real reconciliation prior to Paul VI's death, although Father Hesburgh uh, told me that whenever he visited Rome subsequently, he always went to pray at Paul VI's, uh, at the, uh, crypt. where he's buried there, mm -hmm. at the crypt there where the popes are buried. He always prayed there, fulfilling a promise that he had made to Paul VI, mm -hmm. that whenever he was in Rome, he would visit him. Mm. Uh, Father, uh, Miss Campbell, before I run out of time, uh, first of all, tell me how this book has been received. I know that uh, in the world of Notre Dame, among the domers, uh, Father Hesburgh is, you know, considered a, a minor deity at this point. Uh, writing a <laughs> critical but um, but loving work like this, I imagine has has drawn you a number of critics within the Notre Dame family. Well, Raymond, it's still early days. It's mm -hmm. still early days. The book has just been released, so I'm very grateful. Uh, for you to give me the opportunity to speak about it with you on your program. Sure. Look, uh, you're on to something. You, you know the game. Mm -hmm. I expect my book will play to somewhat mixed reviews at Notre Dame. Father Hesburgh had reached a certain iconic mm -hmm. status in those uh, final decades of his life. And there's been what I call the sort of hagiographical school, Pe yeah. people writing uh, hagiographical uh, literature about him. Mm -hmm. But I had promised Father Hesburgh, I promised Father Hesburgh I would write a serious book about him in which I would try and evaluate with fairness his contribution at Notre Dame and his contributions in American public life, where of mm -hmm. course he's such an important sure. figure on the civil rights issue and mm -hmm. various other Marched with MLK public policy and, issues. Yeah. And uh, I I hope, I hope that uh, my colleagues and friends at Notre Dame will understand that Father Hesburgh deserves a serious uh, mm -hmm. biography. And that's what I've tried to provide. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Raymond, like you, I'm curious to find out what the reception will be mm -hmm. at Notre Dame. Yeah. I'm having an event, event there in a week or so. Oh, good. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Father, tell me about the long-reaching impact. I mean, we, the book captures really Father Hesburgh's impact on Catholic education and certainly the tension I would describe between Our Lady and his visions for Notre Dame. Um, how do you see that influence extending to Catholic higher education today? Is that, was that the turning point that, if you will, unleashed so many of the secularizing forces we see in Catholic education? And what of that do you still see at Notre Dame as we speak? Well, uh, I do see that some of the decisions made by Father Hesburgh, sometimes without him fully realizing what the consequences would be, set us in some of these directions. Mm -hmm. Because, Raymond, if you uh, want acceptance by the secular academic establishment, uh, you begin after a time to sort of mirror yourself on what they do. You want to be ranked with them. You want to be measured in their company, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that began to send Notre Dame in that direction. Mm -hmm. Now, this has reached proportions uh, today where at Notre Dame, there are still so many terrific faculty yeah. uh, who are deeply committed to building a Catholic uh, university. And there are so many good aspects to the campus. But nonetheless, there's this tension operating mm -hmm. uh, whether or not we're going to be fully Catholic, commit ourselves to Excorde Ecclesiae as our guiding charter rather than to 
Land or lakes. Mm. That's the shift we have to acknowledge yeah. and make if we're going to truly claim our Catholic identity. And of course, this surfaces in lots of ways. We've had a recent episode in which uh, there's the talk of covering up. You, you, I don't I know if you've ask you reported on this. it or not. Yes, about the, the Columbus, covering up of Columbus, the Columbus murals. murals. Yeah, yeah, that's. That's a reflection. That's a reflection, I think, of the influence of a certain level of political correctness at Notre Dame that we would cover up these murals that celebrate the bringing of the Gospels to the new world out of some desire to placate, placate criticism and to scapegoat, to scapegoat Christopher Columbus. It's, mm. a, it's not a good approach. I'm a historian. Mm. It's not a good approach to history mm. to undertake such a move. Hmm. Father, in, uh, in 2009, you and Father Hesper got into something of a, a controversy, not that you invited it, but uh, Father Hesper and Notre Dame honored Barack Obama that year. Uh, you publicly disagreed with that decision. How did that affect your relationship? Now, uh, Father Hesper was not involved in the inviting mm -hmm. of President Obama or the honoring of him, but he was very uh, uh, proud to participate in the ceremony. Mm -hmm. President Obama acknowledged him. For Father Ted, he saw the visit of the first African-American president mm -hmm. as a kind of culmination of his efforts on civil rights, uh, sort of a, uh, a recognition that mm -hmm. African-Americans mm -hmm. had truly made it in American society. Mm -hmm. But I took a somewhat different uh, approach. I did not think that a Catholic university should be honoring a president who was so strongly uh, pro-abortion and was facilitating mm. various uh, pro-abortion policies and activities and opposed. So Father Ted and myself, we found ourselves on different sides. Mm but it's a quality of him as a person. It never meant a rupture in our friendship. Mm. I, I would say he was an older man by that point, yeah. and uh, I certainly wasn't going to bring it up to him for mm. argument or anything of that sort. So we essentially agreed to disagree and maintained mm. just a decent personal relationship. Father Bill, before I let you go, uh, do you see a turning, if you will, toward uh, your vision at this point and the vision of the church in that the students, I mean, when I visit Notre Dame, I see students who are suddenly more orthodox than certainly uh, my generation. And when I visit other universities of Catholic pedigree, uh, I find the Notre Dame expression to be uh, more solid and widespread than at a, a place like Georgetown or some other colleges I've visited. Yes, we're very fortunate in the students who come to Notre Dame. Uh, I would say there's a, a core of these students uh, who are deeply involved and have come to Notre Dame seeking a true Catholic education. Mm. And it must be our task to try and serve them well and provide that for them. Mm. Uh, there's uh, perhaps a larger group who, who are glad to be at Notre Dame, who are Catholic, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But our task for them is to draw them into a deeper engagement mm -hmm. uh, with their faith and with Catholic learning. So we have the task ahead, but certainly the kinds of uh, committed students that uh, perhaps are connected to, say, the Center for Ethics and Culture, mm -hmm. et cetera, those students are a great hope for Notre Dame. Mm. Father Miss Campbell, I thank you for being here. The book is American Priest, The Ambitious Life and Conflicted Legacy of Notre Dame's Father Ted Hesburgh by Father Bill, or on the cover, Father Wilson Miss Campbell. Thank you for being here. It's in bookstores everywhere and online. Well, Will Wilder III, The Amulet of Power, is in bookstores, but I have a special announcement. I am going to be in New Orleans at Octavia Books. I'll be signing books. All the details are at RaymondArroyo.com. Come out and see me. Uh, we're going to have a great time. And all the details are there on the website. Until then, you can follow me on Facebook, like me on Twitter. And, of course, you know where to find us. We're here every week. And until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.